Hi, it's Dr. Lori. I'm back with more Rants and Raves. Today's episode of Rants and Raves are answering the questions that I've answered a million times again because you keep asking the same questions. Now, some of you don't read. Some of you do read, but some of you don't read. Some of you are like, oh, well, I want to know about this answer. I want to know, is this the question? Now, it might be that you know, you, you personally or this person has never asked this question and didn't see when I answered it many other times. But I have patience, so I'm going to answer them again. But I want you to get this because this will help you. These rants and raves will help you to understand these concepts that can help you make money if you're reselling or build a good collection for yourself. So here's the first one. Are reproductions worth anything? This all drives me nuts, okay? Because this has been asked a million times and... It's all about reproductions. If you don't, if you want only originals, fine, go out and only get originals. But let me tell you, in the 21st century world, there are a lot of reproductions out there, and a lot of them are worth a lot of money. Oh, gosh, Dr. Lori, I had no idea. I know you had no idea because you're not reading and you're not listening and you're not doing it. I want to help you. So here's what we have to do. First of all, reproductions can have value. Now, they may not have as much value and usually don't have as much value as the original, but they can have value. So you don't have an actual, real, authentic Tiffany lamp that's worth, I don't know, you know, somewhere around $800,000, $900,000, but you've got a knockoff or a reproduction Tiffany lamp that's made very, very well, and that one's worth thousands of dollars. Well, that's not, that's something. Then you say, you know, are they worth anything? Well, what's anything? You know, anything, is that $1,000? Is that $10? Is that, you know, that depends on your financial status, right? You know, anything to me is going to be different than anything to, you know, somebody who has, you know, multi-billions of dollars. You know, that's the way it goes. So that's one of the things I want you to think about. The other thing, you know, something that is a reproduction of a piece made by a famous designer or a famous maker, right? Won't be worth as much as the original, but will be worth money. I've said it over and over and over and over again. So there's that. So yes, it is worth something. The other thing that you need to remember with respect to reproductions is what type of reproduction. Some things are inherently reproduced. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that prints, for example, lithographs, etchings, engravings, and such, get a Rembrandt print, for example. It's going to be worth something, right? But it is inherently a reproduction because prints are reproduced. That's the function of a, a, an original, a, a print, for example. So you want to think about that. The other thing you want to think about with respect to this question, which I've answered a hundred times, is reproductions are not a bad word. Sure, it's not as valuable, it's not as close to the artist's work as an original, but it still can have value. Okay, I think we answered that. Here's the next question I got. Are all things marked Occupied Japan valuable? Okay. So first of all, what's all things? What things are we talking about that may be marked Occupied Japan? So you get an object, I, I don't know, I guess a thing might be an ashtray, a figurine, or those are the things we're thinking about. And on the bottom of it says, made in Occupied Japan. So you want to know, are any of them that have that marking, they're all, are they all valuable? Well, of course they're not all valuable, right? They don't all have value, but here's the thing. They're going to have a value that might be different. So you say, well, what does it mean? Well, you know, are they all ultra valuable? Everything has a value, everything. It just depends on whether or not it's a high enough value to make you look the other way or to make you buy it, right? So that's the first thing about it. Are they valuable? Well, what's valuable, right? That, that question comes up all the time. What is your definition of something being valuable? You know, more than $5, more than $500, more than $5 million. It depends on you and what you think value is. Um, of course, made in occupied Japan is another situation. A lot of people say, oh, it's made in occupied Japan because it was early. So a lot of people who had family who were living after World War II would see this and say, oh, my grandmother always said that was invaluable because it was made in occupied Japan. It was made after the war, the war being World War II, after 1945. So that's one of the things. But, you know, just because it says that doesn't mean it's inherently valuable. You know, if you see something that says made in Germany, made in China, made in Italy, made in, you know, the Czech Republic, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily valuable. That is a mark that indicates for export where the piece was made because there's a law that requires it. That's what it is. 
So it depends on the piece. It depends on, of course, the condition. It depends on who owned the piece. If you have a piece of made in occupied Japan ware that was owned by Winston Churchill, it might be worth more than a piece that wasn't. So again, lots of factors go into it. But when you ask a question like, are things from May, marked made in occupied Japan valuable, you got to be more specific. And I get lots of questions about Beanie Babies, and here's one that I get a lot. I have the Princess Diana Beanie Baby. It's called the Princess Beanie Baby, the purple bear. I have the Princess Beanie Baby, and it has all of the aspects that you talk about, all the criteria and traits that you talk about in your videos, Dr. Lori, except a previous owner cut off the tags and put it into a Ziploc storage bag, a plastic bag. Does that impact value? Well, you know, except, you know, that's like, oh, I have this except all these other things have happened to it. Well, you don't have the thing that has the high value because yours has that exception. So that's the first thing, right? So if you have, and lots of things impact value. So, you know, first of all, many of the aspects about Beanie Babies have to do with tags and have to do with condition. So those are two factors that are very important. So if you don't have those factors, yes, the value has gone down. But it's going to depend on the object. It's going to depend on what kind of condition it's in and whether or not you even have the right type of object. You may not even have a Beanie Baby. You may think it's a Beanie Baby. You may be wrong about that. So I'd have to see. It's going to depend on the object. You know. However, some of these objects that might have something wrong with them could still have significant value, right? Here's an example. You've got a Cartier ring. You know it's Cartier. It's clearly marked. It's tested. It's got 25 diamonds, but the 26th diamond is missing. Well, that's still a valuable Cartier ring, right? Then just, you know, go replace that diamond. There, there's one of the solutions, but the fact that you have something that's valuable to start is going to be important. Okay, but with the exceptions, when you start to do it, accept this, accept that, accept this, then you're going to devalue these pieces. But, you know, again, over and over again, it's, I have this, and it's like it, it's close, but I've got all these other problems. Those other problems impact value. So, again, over and over again, well, mine is the same. It's basically the same. No, there's nothing basically the same about your Beanie Baby that has tags cut off. Those tags are cut off. That value goes down. This one's a winner. I have a painting. It's not signed. Is it worthless? Somebody asked me that question again. Well, you know, is the Mona Lisa worthless? She's not signed. That painting is not signed by Leonardo da Vinci, right? Again, if it's not signed, that doesn't mean it's automatically not valuable, right? Just because it's not signed doesn't mean it's not valuable. I've said that over and over and over again. But immediately, you folks are going, oh, well, it's a painting and it's not signed, and oh, just throw it in the trash. It's worthless. We go from, like, Mach 10. We go to 0 to 60 in, you know, no, no time. It's, like, so quick. You know, it's not that it's worthless. It's basically a particular value based on the good qualities of this piece. I want you to look for quality. I always teach you to try to look for quality, and I give you lists of what to look for and how to identify that quality. Signatures are not the end-all, be-all when it comes to works of art. They don't have to necessarily be signed to be valuable. Many unsigned pieces are valuable. So it's not, oh, it's not signed worthless, throw it out, forget it, throw it in the trash, it's gone. I've shown you on Real Bargains a million times, these people who are finding things that are unsigned that actually have a lot of value. So you want to think about that. But no, if it's, if, it, if it's unsigned, that doesn't mean that it's worthless. Forget worthless. Get that out of your vocabulary. These pieces are not worthless. We have to identify what they're worth. And finally, a comment. Hi, Dr. Lori. I'm 25 and I love antiques. I have my grandmother's china and I love it. It makes me happy. It's from the 1930s and it makes me happy. Thank goodness somebody gets this. You know, all of these people who are saying, oh, kids don't like antiques, young people don't like antiques, no one loves antiques. Hey, please, this is so inaccurate, it's not even funny anymore. You know, it's all these people who want to just, who want to really give license. They want to get a get out of jail free card. They want to have permission to say, oh, nobody wants my antiques, so I'm throwing everything out because I don't want to be bothered. Okay, fine. If you don't want to be bothered, don't be bothered. But that's not really what's going on here. What's going on here is you don't want to be bothered. You don't want to deal with it. You don't want to do appraisal. You don't want to deal with the things. You don't want to really have the conversation with your kids or your grandkids about these objects. 
So you're so you just use the blanket. Oh, kids don't care about it. Nobody cares about it. None of the young people care about art antiques or collectibles. First of all, people go through phases, all different phases of your life. Remember when you didn't want to be seen with your mother or father out in public when your friends might see you, and then you grew out of that phase. You know that was sort of one of those things that you grew out of. Or it was, oh gosh, I can't believe mom's wearing those clothes, whatever it might be, or those shoes, or whatever it might be, and you didn't want to be seen with people. So that happens, and that changes. People change about their, their interest in what's nice to decorate their houses. Interior design changes all the time. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I chose that sofa. It's so ugly and dated. I hate it now. And it changes, right? That happens to most of us. We go through these different cycles in our lives. That's true also with kids or grandkids at certain times of their life they don't they say they don't want certain pieces and then as they get older they go where was that piece i want it now you know that kind of thing that happens a lot so many people will say that that young people don't care about antiques they don't want to collect them they don't want to purchase them i have many 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 very youthful clients very youthful followers very youthful fans you know in their teens, in their 20s, and even younger than that, little kids who follow me will go, I love old stuff. I love the history. I love it all. Thank goodness somebody's writing in. In the comments, tell me, do you like antiques? Did you like them when you were young? Has it changed that you started to like them now that you're older? Or maybe it went the other way where you said, oh, I had them and I enjoyed them, but not now. People change. The time changes. But finally, someone who stops this myth of, no, oh, all young people hate antiques. It's not every single young person hates antiques. It's just not true. It's just not true that this is the case. This is one that I really am so tired of hearing, and it's so, so mistaken. It's such a big fallacy that people will say, oh, my gosh, no, none of the young people like antiques. Ask your granddaughter. Ask your grandson if they want something of yours. You know, I have not yet found a grandson who didn't want his grandfather's fishing rod or his baseball glove or something like that. I haven't found one out there yet. Or a granddaughter who said to their grandmother, no, I really don't want something from you. That's very rarely, rarely the case.